I hope you um, have enjoyed the conference and the food. And thank you. And Granville in Newark in Central Ohio. I don't know which airports you flew through, but I'm sure you've noticed the infrastructure problems. I, I can guarantee it. That's good. Any, any uh, airport. Um, I want to reiterate the thanks to everybody who worked behind the scenes, uh, on the scenes, for um, throughout this conference and in preparation for the conference. I'm not going to go through the long list of names, but you've, you've seen them, so I'm going to thank Logan again. Um, one of my students here at the Gonzaga Institute. I want to thank the UMKC students for making the trip um, all the way from Kansas City, uh, Matt Forstadter, Saeed Gonzaga, uh, Denison University for hosting us and providing, <laughs> uh, and providing a, a home for the Gonzaga Institute and helping with a lot of the logistics uh, for, for this uh, conference. Uh, the ITS staff are fantastic with everything they've done uh, to make this happen. The videos um, from yesterday are already posted on our YouTube channel. There's a link uh, on our website, and I believe the rest of the videos will be posted. Uh, if, if they're not posted already, they'll be posted tonight. Uh, that, that's the raw footage, but eventually there'll be edited versions and higher quality versions that'll be uh, available uh, on our website. I encourage you to um, continue to follow us um, not necessarily on social media, but you can do that too. But follow uh, our publications, join our mailing list, um, invite your friends and, um, uh, and policy makers, uh, decision makers to watch for what we're doing and our partners, including the Levy Institute, including the Haas Institute, people who are challenging the TINA philosophy. TINA, that is, there is no alternative, right? Uh, and what we're saying here is that there are plenty of alternatives. And what we're trying to do with the Institute is to showcase a lot of these alternatives. And as you've seen from, from the conversations that we don't necessarily agree on all of these alternatives. But we're saying there are alternatives. There are different ways of looking at public policy. Um, and we should um, be trying and experimenting with some of these. Um, our work at the Institute is uh, designed to showcase those policy options. Um, some of us talk about job guarantees, some of us talk about public banking, some of us talk about postal banking, some of us talk about alternative ways of financing housing and education and infrastructure. Um, but what we all agree on is that a, a different world is possible. And um, enough is enough with, with the Tina philosophy. Uh, people who tell us there is no alternative other than austerity and more austerity. Um, so that's. That's really the message. So uh, invite your friends and your networks to join us um, and support us and partner with us uh, in any way we can. Um, that being said, I want to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening, um, Alan Brown, uh, president of the Public Banking Institute, author of several books, um, but especially Web of Debt, uh, one of her most popular uh, books. and. Um, I'm blanking on the other one. The public, you know, the public bank solution, of course. Yeah. Um, Ellen um, was kind enough to, you know, push around her schedule, including family schedule, to be with us uh, this evening throughout this conference. And um, when we contacted her to join the institute as a research scholar, she was very eager to um, to join us. So thank you for being here. And without any further ado. Please join me in welcoming Alan Brown. Thanks, Heather. And um, thanks to the Gonzaga Institute for sponsoring this conference, which has been really interesting. Um, like uh, uh, Rowan, I'm not an economist and I'm not a professor. I'm a lawyer. And like Marco, I see myself as a, as a translator. Um, I try to put complicated economic ideas and developments into uh, high school English. And as a litigator, one thing I learned was to, um, if you wanted to capture the judge's attention, you had to get your argument in simple, simple English in, right up front in the first paragraph. So how do I? So, 
Yeah. So here's my quick summary of why we the people should own the bank. <laughs> we are doing all the work and the bankers are um, getting the fish. Uh, we have a situation today where businesses can't get loans, students are drowning in debt, mortgages are underwater, municipalities are in austerity mode, um, mass we have massive and growing income inequality, and there seems to be no money for the public and unlimited money for the banks. So how did uh, Wall Street get control? We actually, I'm sort of repeating what you've heard all day, but it's largely through a series of money myths. One of them is that money is created by the government. These, are, these myths are like mutually con contradictory. Most people, if you ask them, where does money come from? They'll say it's created by the government. And yet, if you say, um, then the government wouldn't have to balance its books because you know they can issue the money. And they say, no, no, a government's like a household. You have to balance your book. You have to, you know, balance your checkbook. And if you say, if the government prints the money, then uh, wouldn't they just be able to print what they need for their budget? And then people will say, no, no, that would be inflationary. And that, of course, banks say that they're, they act only as intermediaries taking in deposits and um, lending them out again. And we know that's not true, in fact. Banks create virtually all of our money supply on this chart. The, what governments create is the blue line, so it's a very small part of the money supply, 92% we just heard today. And um, the red line is M2, so most of the money is created by banks, and we know that because the Bank of England just said so as well. They said that 97% the, um, of the British money supply is created by bank, commercial banks when they make loans. So what's wrong with this model? First of all, the interest. Um, Banks, uh, actually I'm repeating this, this as well, that Marco said this, but banks create the, the principal, but they don't create the interest. And over the course of a 30-year loan or a 30-year bond issue, you're going to owe twice as much back as was put out there in the first place. So in order to support the whole system, you have to continually get more and more borrowers sucked into the bottom of this pyramid in order to support the lenders at the top. And when you run out of borrowers, you wind up in, with a... Um, a, an exponential curve that collapses when the parasite runs out of its food source. So what you have is a debt overhang with the, a debt, debt at interest always growing faster than the real economy. And exponential curves, of course, or exponential growth is unsustainable. Uh, second is the fact of control. We've handed over to banks. Um, the power to, first of all, when you put your money in the bank, it becomes the property of the bank. And ever since, Dodd, or ever since uh, Glass-Steagall was repe repealed, they can do what they want with it. They can gamble with it. They can put it in derivatives. Uh, they can determine who gets the loans and on what terms, so they can make very low interest loans to themselves, and they can charge us whatever the market will bear, which can be quite high, if we're, depending on how desperate we are. Or they can refuse to lend it off. And third is the risk. Um, because they've got our money, and in fact they create our money, we feel compelled to bear, bail them out, as we did in 2008. And then in 2010, the government said, no more bailouts, we're going to do bail-ins, which means that they will capitalize themselves. I mean, they're actually required, banks, the big banks are required to turn our deposits or their creditors' money, but it turns out, I mean, this is all obscurely worded in the Dodd-Frank Act, but the largest class of creditor of any bank is their depositors. So you can't even sue them if you take their money because, or if they take your money, because it's right there in the law now that, the, um, that they're required to turn your deposits into their capital. And that was also agreed to um, last November at the um, G20 conference in Brisbane. Lost the ability to <laughs> All right. Okay, so you might think you're covered by FDIC insurance. This chart's a little old, but the FDIC fund actually has more than that in it now, but not much more. So that very thin blue line is what's in the FDIC fund. The thick green line is uh, the deposits 
all the deposits in the country, so about half of those are covered by FDIC uh, insurance or up to $250,000. But the real threat is the big red, uh, nearly $300 trillion in derivatives. And under the Bankruptcy Reform Act of 2005, derivatives go first in a bankruptcy. So that means that they could wipe out the, the entire collateral of a big bankrupt bank. So I've talked to several um, legislators who, who will say they're not worried because they're they're not worried about their deposits because they're securitized, they're collateralized. But they go second after the derivatives in a bankruptcy, and the derivatives players are all the bankers. They every over-the-counter derivative has a bank on one side, at least one side, and and usually on both sides. So we're talking about the banks get their money out first. And then if there's anything left over, then the governments might get it, and then the FDIC might get it. But the problem is, so, some people, like, you know, I'm in the money reform group, so I hear these arguments all the time, and there are a lot of people that say, well, this is terrible that banks create our money, we should uh, take away that power and just allow banks to um, lend their deposits, which is what people think they do. But the problem is, then you would be eliminating this entire mass of our money supply between the blue and the red. We actually need that credit that our whole bank, our whole business system runs on credit, that you have to pay your workers and materials before you have a product to, to sell, so you, so you do it with credit lines, and you can have many, many different little businesses in the chain of production of a product that are all borrowing, so you could wind up borrowing a lot more than even the, the actual price of the product. So if you eliminate all that bank-created um, credit, which is money, you would eliminate their whole credit system. And you would, uh, like, what would you do about your credit cards? We, we've gotten quite addicted to our credit cards. But they just, that money is not really there. They're just issuing credit against their books. So, the solution, I would say, the problem with the system is not that banks create money. I think that's actually a good system. It's actually very responsive to the needs of, they're responding to the credit needs of the people. It's really the people who create the money. Um, what the bank does is monetize your own promise to repay. So their real function is to determine credit worthiness and do, do the work work. So, um, our current banking system is good. What's wrong is who owns it and who controls it. So if uh, the government owns it, uh, th this is what I would consider the ideal system. It was in colonial Pennsylvania in the first half of the 18th century, which was uh, Benjamin Franklin's time. So at that time, most of the colonies issued, I mean, all the colonies issued their own paper script, but most of them just issued the script and they uh, theoretically, they would pull it back in taxes, but it was a lot easier to issue the script than to get it back. Um, but in Pennsylvania, what they did was they lent the money. Theor it was theoretically a land bank, but they didn't, didn't I mean, that was just sort of a, a label to, get, to make it look like it was backed by something besides gold. So what you could do, in theory, would be to print, say, 105 units. Uh, it was at 5% interest, whereas the Bank of England was charging 8%. And there was no Bank of England. I mean, there weren't banks in Pennsylvania, and the whole economy was very, um, not much was happening in uh, Pennsylvania. So, so let's say you just started with $105. Uh, you could lend the $100, spend the $5, and then there's enough money out there to pay principal and interest. You could lend the $100 all over, spend the $5 all over. It all comes back as principal and interest. You, you could do that over and over, and it's a s sustainable system. You're not continually having to expand to cover the interest. So during the period that that system was in place, um, the Pennsylvania colonists paid no taxes except an excise tax on liquor. There was no price inflation as a result of money printing. There was a bit of price inflation, but it was because of um, shortages. And the government paid no debt, so it was a quite sustainable system. Um, I originally wrote Web of Debt, and then I uh, wound up writing, after the 2008 collapse, um, I, I knew that there was only one, one state in the country that had its own bank, which was North Dakota, so I was watching these states. And at first there were four states that were in the, in the black, and then there were three, and then there were two, and then there was one, it was North Dakota. 
So, so I started writing about it. It was like late 2008, and um, and I got a lot of, you know, got flooded with emails and stuff. First we formed a Google group, and then that turned into an institute after we felt like we were, like, we were like the experts on it, on it, and it was time to get out and do something. But always I would get this objection, well, North Dakota has oil, it's a farming state, you know, they're small, they're not like us, we couldn't do that here. So I thought I should look into um, public banks globally and historically, so that's why I wrote a follow-up book called um, <coughs> The Public Bank Solution. So it turns out, to my own surprise, that um, this is actually, the figures are actually from the 1990s, but 40% of banks are publicly owned. They're largely in the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, which are, that's where 40% of the uh, global population is. And um, the, all those countries escaped the credit crisis like, like North Dakota initially. Now they're getting caught up. I mean, it's a global, global economy, so they're all getting caught up now. But initially, they did really quite remarkably well. So in the US, we have one model. That's the Bank of North Dakota. Um, it's been there since 1919. It was formed by um, the Nonpartisan League, who were, it was a great name. I thought we need to revive that. It was like neither right nor left. It was all about state, state sovereignty. The farmers were losing their farms to the Wall Street bankers, and they decided they wanted to keep their money at home and to use it for their own purposes. So they've been um, going quite well ever since, and particularly in the last 30 years or so, when they've really gotten aggressively into, into uh, commercial banking. Uh, they have the nation's lowest unemployment rate, one of the lowest foreclosure rates, the lowest default rate on credit card debt, and they have uh, six times as many local banks per capita as the, uh, the national average. So they have lots of little banks. They, they don't compete with the little banks. They partner with them. And they have very few of the big banks. In uh, November of last year, the Wall Street Journal came out with an article that said um, that the Bank of North Dakota was actually more profitable than Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan Chase. That it was uh, had a um, return on equity of 18.56 percent, about 70 percent higher than at Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan. Quite amazing. And the reason is that they just have a more, it's a, it's a better model. It's a more profitable model. They don't pay bonuses, fees, or commissions. Uh, they have no high-paid CEO. The, the highest paid person is the president, which w was getting $240,000 a year, the last figure I saw in it, uh, compared to $24 million for the president of uh, Wells Fargo. Uh, they don't advertise. They have a captive deposit base in the state itself. They don't. They only have one branch, which is in the capital city. Um, so basically, what they do is the local bank is like the front office or like the franchisee, as yeah, that you know, model. Um, so the Bank of North Dakota is the is the they they actually are. They're not FDIC members, but they do have Federal Reserve. Privileges, but I think they do most of their bar borrowing from the fe federal home loan bank. But anyway, so they have access to all this liquidity, which they they share with the public, with the um, local bank. So the local bank would, you know, find they're the ones that do all the determining creditworthiness, the loan officers, the tellers, and so forth, the regular banking. And then the Bank of North Dakota comes in and partners with loans that they that they particularly support. They have there's certain policies that they support. They're, they support agriculture, energy, and education in particular. Um, so anything that fills their mandate and that's profitable, they, they might, for example, actually put up 90% of a loan and the, front bank, the, the local bank will put up 10%. And then the Bank of North Dakota will guarantee the whole thing so they don't have to worry about capital. So they help, help with capital, help with liquidity, and allow these local banks to make loans that they wouldn't otherwise be able to make, like local development projects. Um, and so the uh, Bank of North Dakota model is their de a depository for all state revenues by law. Uh, they're set up as a DBA of the state, so it's North Dakota doing business as the Bank of North Dakota. 
So technically, all of the assets of the state are assets of the bank. So it's, it's just heavily capitalized and hev heavily, it's got a huge deposit base. Um, they, in the last decade, they've paid $40 million annually uh, as a dividend to the state, which is quite a lot for a state that is the size, it's 670,000 people, so it's like the size of a medium uh, sized city. Uh, they've had an average return on equity of 20% in the last, uh, since the credit collapse. Um, they have a mandate to serve the public. Every, people say things like, well, do we, you know, we don't want politicians running our banks, or how do you keep the bank from being corrupt? But for one thing, would you rather have a public bank in charge of your money, or a Wall Street bank? I mean, at least they have a mandate to serve the public. They're audited three different ways, and they're totally transparent. So you can look and see, see what they're up to, and you can sue them if they're, if they're not following their, their mandate. And it's not just the Bank of North Dakota. Um, the Sparkassen Banks of Germany are, they have many little uh, local public banks that have a mandate to um, serve the local businesses. So they, they can't go out of their local community. And again, it's a public model where the profits go back to the center. Um, and they, too, are doing much better than the commercial banks, including Deutsche Bank. In fact, Deutsche Bank is not doing well at all right now. Um, the pale blue is the commercial bank. And the orange is the Sparkassen Bank. So they're obviously doing much better now than the commercial banks. The green is the credit unions. They're doing well as well. Uh, the commercial banks did do well before the credit crisis, but that was when they were you know, doing collateralized debt obligations and mortgage-backed securities, and then they got in trouble for it. Uh, so I've been working with, I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to say, say about this, but. But anyway, I've been working with various elected officials. So one particular elected official uh, is that they're very interested in doing it. But he said, um, we don't want to put up any money, and we don't want to take any risks. So if you can give me a model <laughs> that will, so, you know, if I can set up this bank, we're interested. So I do have an idea how they can do that. Um, but also, they're interested in using all right, the California um, Inf Infrastructure Bank so you could, it's already got some money, but it's a revolving fund. So what it does is it lends it out, comes back, they lend it again, it comes back. So if you're lending it at 5%, then you make um, 5%, and that's all. It takes $20 million in California, which is where I'm from, uh, to start a bank. And uh, that, that would be you know, a small bank, and this is not going to be a bank big enough to run the state's infrastructure. But anyway, if you just wanted to set up a pilot project, that's what I want to do is just get the thing going so that we have an example. But we've had um, 20 states that have introduced bills of one sort or another for a state-owned bank, and then we have a lot of cities and counties that are working on it. We haven't gotten any passed yet. I just think if we just did one as a model, then the others would follow. Um, so if you ha are a bank, a depository bank, you could take that same 20 million pull in 200 million of your money out of J.P. Morgan Chase or wherever it is now, somewhere out of state, you know, so you don't have the objection that you're hurting your local bank. And, um, and then you can make nine times as many loans, assuming you hold back 10% for your reserve requirements, so you can make uh, nine million instead of one million on that 20 million. So here's how they could, assuming they, they've got money for the infrastructure bank, They've already got the capital covered, so let's say 20 million for, for from your infrastructure bank. Um, right now, California is paying 69 billion dollars, or it has a 69 billion dollar pool that's managed by the treasurer. It's the treasurer's investment pool. So they have this huge amount of money, and they're paying 0.3 percent interest on it, on that whole amount of money. And I've watched the the figures on it, they, it doesn't go down all that much. It's not like they have to worry because it's going to get wiped out and they need to keep it very liquid. So they could take some of that and um, use it for, oh, let's see. Oh, I, I know, I was gonna, I was gonna, I'm using that for a model for what they probably want in interest. So let's pay them 0.3% on their 200 million. So you take 200 million minus 20 million in reserve, that's 180 million to lend. 
So here is my suggestion. Just buy bonds or that buy some basic municipal bonds. You could do this overnight with one person sitting in an office. It's just a matter of shuffling money around on a computer. And you would instantly have a profit of 3% times 180 equals 5.4 million minus your 0.6 million pots of funds. So you can make a 24% profit immediately. I mean, I'd be interested if anybody tells me I can't do it, but I think they can do that. Um, or you could, if you have no money to start with, you could issue a bond. You could do a bond issue at uh, 20 million times 3%. Cost of funds is 0.6 million. Uh, same for the deposits uh, times 0.3%. So your cost of funds overall is a little higher, but you can still make a net return of 21%. Or if you think that it's a small bank and you should hold back more than 10% in reserve, you could hold 30% in reserve and your figures still come out to a 15% return. Or you could, at what the Bank of North Dakota did was they originally bought bonds and then when they had built up a nice capital reserve of their own, so they're not gambling with the state's money, they're using their own capital, then they got into commercial lending where they can make a nice interest rate. So let's say you did that and built up a little capital and then you wanted to use your $180 million to make small business loans or to join with the local banks making small business loans then you could have a, a return of 39%. So anyway, much more money than they're making now on their quite substantial reserves. Um, besides avoiding risk and, um, well besides avoiding risk, that, that you could stay 50% on the cost of infrastructure if you borrowed from your own bank. For the, I saw somewhere that that's considered the average for infrastructure financing is 50%, or you're going to pay as much again for financing as you pay in principle. And that was true for the Bay Bridge retrofit, which they just finished. It was supposed to be, or it was six billion, but by the time they finish paying the thing off, it'll be 12 billion. The bullet train, the initial outlay was 10 billion almost, and the interest on that will be another 10 billion. I mean, I've seen figures it's going to be way more expensive than that. But anyway, that was just the initial that the voters voted for. So if we, the people on the banks, we can move from a parasitic model to one of symbiosis. Public banks feed the economy rather than feeding off it. <coughs> These are my two books on this subject. <coughs> and for more information, my two websites, publicbankinginstitute.org and ellenbrown.com. I've got uh, over 300 articles on my website that, uh, on this subject. Oh yeah, many banks. That's okay. the thing. There are more banks per capita by a factor of six than in other states. A lot more because the Bank of North Dakota, first of all, you know, the small banks in other states have, they've shrunk radically. They've had to sell out to the big banks because they can't meet the, the regulatory requirements. And it, during the credit crisis, the small banks did not sell off their loans the way in other states that they, they did they did sell off their loans also because they didn't have the capital and you know if you if you sell off your loans then you can use your capital over and over again for new loans but because in North Dakota they had the Bank of North Dakota guaranteeing the loans then they could keep them on their books and so it was old old fashioned ba banking where they they actually care whether lo loans get paid off and so they they take the good good borrowers and and they do workouts and so forth. Sorry? Oh, yeah, they, they, I mean, I'm, I haven't been there. My understanding is they do, but it's just not nearly to the extent that, you know, they're not at all the dominant. Yeah. What's the nature of the resistance in the states when you're working with them to try to get them? Well, I think it's mostly um, 
that they just don't understand it. And politicians, you know, tend to be very conservative. They need a groundswell of support. The farthest we got was in California, where we had a bill for a feasibility study that passed both houses of the legislature, but Jerry Brown wouldn't sign it. But I heard that he said privately something like, good idea, make me do it. In other words, if he had a big constituency pushing it, they would do it. And I've heard that he's you know, now interested. So are you, are you able to get grassroots support then to, to push that? Um, well, we, I have, I'm, I'm not really sure how much I'm supposed to say about this, but yeah, we're, we're making good progress there in California. And there's another city where we're making quite remark, I mean, I'm really excited about this one, where the person we're working with was a bank, has been a banker for many years, and uh, he said, he totally got it, and he said, I could have this bank up and, and profitable in three months, and he said, and we don't need legislation, it's a city. He thought he can just go ahead and do it, and we're we're working it with him right now. So. Good luck. Yeah, I think that would be amazing to have a model, and then my guess is, you know, other people would, would they'd all follow. Yeah. <laughs> Regressive banking state is immediately north of maybe the most regressive uh, banking state in the union. Mm -hmm. uh, second is sort of a question. I'm wondering, if, can you say a little bit more about the relation between the Bank of North Dakota on the one hand and then the private banks that are partners with them on the other? For example, the loans that you were mentioning, are these loan participation arrangements pursuant yeah. to which? Yeah. All right. Well, I think they do it both ways, yeah. Okay. Any further detail on that partnering, I, I'd love to hear. Um, Okay, well, I mean, I think that the local bank gets the loan and then the Bank of North Dakota chooses later the thing, yeah, the things that they particularly support. But they, we, we have a um, retired Bank of North Dakota man on our advisory board and he said, we are not politicians, we are not development banks, that we are, you know, we are prudent, we do prudent old fashioned banking. They don't do derivatives because they say, if we don't understand it, we don't do it. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, I think that they pride themselves on being good bankers, but you know, they all have this North Dakota accent. They're so, I mean, they're so honest. You can, but I've never heard any complaints about any form of corruption. Uh, people say, well, that the, that the profit or the uh, success of the Bank of North Dakota is due to oil, but the oil boom didn't really hit till 2010, and they were already in the spring of 2009, they were already the only state that um, escaped the credit crisis. So, and also, the, and then people say, well, they're helping with fracking, which is immoral, but they're not. They're, what they do, the bank does things like fund the roads and the hotels. Well, the roads are being damaged, heavily damaged by this, all this heavy equipment that has come in from outside. I mean, they feel like they've been invaded, and so they have to fix the roads for the farmers, for their farming community. You know. And they're pushing heavy, heavily for alternative energy for and I guess they've had booms and busts before, so so they didn't. They knew that the bust would probably come, and so they're making other, you know, doing other alternatives. They do, yeah. <laughs> they, when they were first formed, it was the, they were Swedish and Norwegian farmers. There's a movie on it. That, yeah, they, did, they didn't speak English at all, and they weren't going to have anything to do with any kind of socialist movement. And then they realized that they were actually losing their farms unfairly. That the, the bank, it was a, it was a um, Rockefeller bank, was connected to the railroad, was connected to the granaries, so it was all one big cartel. And they, they, it was good grain, and they weren't taking the grain. And so when they realized that, then they then they, and they changed the name of it <laughs> so that it didn't sound socialist, but it actually was socialist. But you know, it's a very, it's a very uh, Republican state, so. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, hi, I, I, I love your work <laughs> in general. Um, I just had a question about other 
public banking kind of reforms. I mean, I know there's a postal banking movement at the moment. There's a movement to try and have public accounts at central banks in certain countries. Um, there's, there's kind of mobile money in, in, in some countries. So I'm just curious how you see those other elements of the banking you know, function that, the, I mean, you seem to have laid out a pretty comprehensive analysis of the credit creation element and how to make that public and create institutions. I'm just curious how those other parts make it. Mm -hmm. um, well, if, if they follow the Bank of North Dakota model, I mean, it seems to me that ideally you would have a bank in every state, like the Bank of North Dakota, that's kind of like your central bank servicing your local banks, which service local business. But they're not really, the, the Bank of North Dakota people say, if you want to set up a bank, don't try to compete with the bank, because you're, you're going to, you know, you need them on your side. But they, so they won't, if they did go for the, um, the depositors, the individual depositors, they would be competing. But if you have postal banks, that they can service the depositors, all those people that are unbanked, that are they're being charged very high rates for just for check cashing and simple services. So, so it's a, t a totally different market for the post postal banks. Plus, you know, they, in other countries, the postal bank business is what has saved a lot of these banks that otherwise regular, I mean, sorry, post offices, regular um, letter delivery is, is not very profitable. I mean, you know, they could, they could go bankrupt over that. So the postal business actually could save our postal bank just as it has in other countries when it's profitable. I have a comment and a question. Um, a few months ago, I, I was speaking to someone from the New York Fed um, and asked him, asked him about the public bank in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the state of North Dakota. He said, uh, he said he knows about it, but he's not sure what it is. <laughs> and he changed the subject. <laughs> so I'm not sure you know, uh, 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 what that means. Um, my question is, um, in, in, the state of, in the state of North Dakota, uh, what is the split of the credit in, in terms of the size of businesses? Uh, is it different or consistent to other states in the nation? Uh, are we seeing uh, loans go out to uh, uh, small and medium enterprises at a better rate or, or at a lower rate or the same? Um, well, they, they give I know they give 1% loans to startup farmers and startup businesses because they want to encourage that. They give 1.7% loans currently to students. Um, so they have certain sectors that they give cheap loans to. But I think in general, um, and they also do like disaster relief, there are a lot of things that they kind of specialize in. But in general, I think what they do is to do the best service. So they don't necessarily try to undercut everybody else's prices. What they, they do is to do the, the average, the going rate, like they pay the going rate on deposits, although it's the state deposits, but that's what they say. They, they pay a competitive rate. That's, um, yeah. What's the difference between the services offered by the public and the state bank and a credit union, for instance? Well, a credit union is smaller. It's it's owned by its members, and it's. I think it can only make loans to its members. It can't make big. I mean, they, they can't make a big, like city development type loan. They're not that. The Wall Street banks have made sure. I mean, they're they're trying to suppress the whole credit union movement that that would otherwise be burgeoning. So they're very limited in the types of loans they can make. Whereas the Bank of North Dakota can make big development loans and they can allow smaller banks to make loans that are much bigger than they would otherwise be able to make. So they're really servicing a different, different. But would there be cooperation between them? Oh yeah, they, um, they would help them as they do the other local banks. In um, Ireland, they have a, a lot of credit unions and the Sparkhousing people, the, the German Sparkhousing group has come to Ireland several times and uh, talk to legislators. In fact, they'll come to your community <laughs> and talk to your legislators, even though they're not trying to sell their spark I mean, they're not allowed to grow. The spark can't grow. But they're under a lot of pressure in Europe to the regulate. They're trying to change the regulations so that 
they will have to, it used to be that because they're a public bank, they didn't need to meet the capital requirements because they're guaranteed by the, by the government. But now they're trying to change that, so they have to have capital anyway. Basically, they're trying to turn them into private banks, which won't be able to compete with the big, big banks. So in order to show what a great model it is, they're, they're out there um, proselytizing, sort of. So they've been to Ireland several times, and there a number of politicians in several different parties are promoting it. But, but their model would be that, um, you, that there are the credit unions, and then these local public banks, like in, like in Germany, you know, the credit unions and local public banks are both local things. The credit unions tend to service the individuals, whereas the public bank, or the Sparkhausen Bank service the small and medium sized businesses, and that's the reason their export business has done so well for such a relatively small country. I think at one time they were the biggest exporters, and then they were second to China. But um, it's because they support their local business rather than sort of gouging their businesses like, like our banks tend to do, or our small Would and medium sized businesses. on the basis of the fact that their profits stay in the state rather than I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Would the national, I'm sorry, the North Dakota Bank promote themselves on the basis of the fact that the profits stay in the state rather than disappearing overnight to some central uh, headquarters? Sorry, is I just that, didn't hear very well. <clears throat> is, that, is, that, is the benefit uh, that you can sell your customers on the fact that the, the North Dakota Bank, the North Dakota Bank, keeps its profits in the state. So they're circulating right. in the state rather than disappearing like landmark money out of the yeah. state uh, every yeah, day. So that was the whole idea in the beginning. They wanted to keep their money in the state. They didn't want it to going, going off to Wall Street. They wanted to determine where it went. But, and the thing I think most people don't understand and what I keep trying to get across to the legislators is that we're not just talking about years going into business as a bank. As a bank, you are able to create money, which is a, you know, it's a power that you otherwise don't have. If you don't have it as a, as a revolving fund, you don't have it as an infrastructure bank. If you want to have this amazing power that was handed over to Wall Street, um, you need to be a depository bank, and then you're allowed to do like nine times what you could have done otherwise with your capital. I know, I, I used to, I, we have this quite large group now, and, I, I would tell people that they should say that, like the woman that was heavily knocking on doors in Sacramento in California, and I said, well, you got to tell them they can create, you know, create money with a bank. That's why you want to have a bank. And she said, I can't tell them that. They're not going to believe me. I don't sound like I know what I'm talking about. They'll think I'm a crank. But now that the Bank of England has actually come out and said it, you know, we've got ammunition now. I think things are definitely changing. I mean, the fact that they even had hearings on that in the parliament, which was due to the positive money people. So if you, if you have groups, you know, that are keep pushing and pushing and pushing on these things and raise awareness, I think eventually when people get it, then you might see some change. So I have a question. Uh, in Ohio, we have a, a state finance, Ohio Finance Fund. We have an Economic and Community Development Institute, which does microloans up to $350,000 to small businesses. We have other agencies I could list. Is it a, just a matter then of uh, coordinating a, some sort of plan between various entities that have funds that are made available in various specialized way to, to, to get some of those deposits into a public bank? Yeah, you know, if that you've just, got money. Is the trick just getting them to, <laughs> to say, you know, we're going to form a bank and, and let these entities feed into it? Well, it, if you form it privately, you're not going to have nearly the reach of a government-owned bank. And if you're a private entity, you can't really join with the government. You know, a, the reason I'm pushing public banking is that you've got all these, all this revenue, like that town I was telling you about. The, the man's really excited about. It. He says we've got a trillion, or sorry, a billion dollars in cash flow. They're broke, but yeah. they've got all this payroll and stuff that money that runs through the city and they can put that in a bank. Whereas if you're a small group, people say to me, well, why don't we start our own bank? It's like, you, we don't have anything like $69 billion that's just sitting there making almost nothing like the state, the state has. 
So the tactic is really to work with state legislators. Yeah, that's, that's ideal. But I, I appreciate the whole thing about all these little groups that are trying to do something. Yeah. If we can get together in some way, I mean, I, that's a chance, something I always think about too. How can we make, make ourselves be one big movement? We need some sort of message that everybody's behind. I don't know if it's a political party or a, so it's kind of like the Occupy movement, but the, they didn't really have a, a, a solution. They, they presented the problem, but now we need to have some sort of solution. That, well, we talked earlier about uh, Bernie Sanders campaign. Somehow we need to get Bernie and his movement, right. which is already <laughs> just blowing people away. To, and we already have the dream team from MMT giving advice to Bernie. So public banking and MMT should somehow be linked and have some strategy to get, uh, uh, to get a, the advantage. That we don't have a big PR fund, but Bernie has the PR. <laughs> He's doing it uh, with his message. And if he could just somehow be convinced to, to say, hey, there's a new way to do money. There's a new way to do economics. And I'm not going to do it that old way. Just present it in that simple, simplistic kind of way. Uh, it doesn't have to be the way it's been. My thought. <laughs> that was one that I was going to bring up earlier. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Dr. Brown again. Thanks again to all the speakers, all the participants, all the students who helped with everything. Um, it was a pleasure having you here. It was a pleasure hearing the conversations and participating in all this um, exciting set of ideas. Um, and we hope to um, stay connected. Thank you again. Good night. <laughs>